not long ago, I happened to talk with one of our writers, a great artist, about the comedy of life, about the difficulty of defining a phenomenon and naming it with the right word. I had just mentioned to him that, having known Vo from Vit for almost 40 years, I only this year truly understood one of the most vivid characters in the play, Mal Chalin, and I understood him only when this very writer with whom I was speaking clarified Mal Chalin for me, suddenly bringing him to life in one of his satirical essays. I will talk more about Mal Chalin someday, it's an excellent topic. You know, my companion suddenly said to me, clearly long affected by his idea, whatever you write, what or you depict whatever you point out in an artistic work, you will never equal reality. Whatever you illustrate will come out weaker than in real life. You may think you've captured the most comical aspect of a certain phenomenon in life, seized its most grotesque side, but not at all. Reality will immediately present you with a face in some wind that you hadn't even imagined one that exceeds everything your observation and imagination could create. I realized this back in 46 when I started writing, maybe even earlier, and this fact has often astonished me and made me wonder about the usefulness of arts, given its apparent impotence. Indeed, if you trace even a seemingly unremarkable fact of real life, and if you have the insight and perception, you, you'll find a depth to it that surpasses even Shakespeare. But here is the question. Whose insight and who has the power? Not only does creating and writing artistic works require an artist in their own right, but even just noticing a fact does. For one observer, all life's events pass by in the most touching simplicity, so obvious that there is nothing to ponder, not even worth a look, yet the same events might trouble another observer so deeply that, unable to generalize and simplify them to draw a straight line and be at peace, they resort to a different kind of simplification and simply put a bullet in their head to quiet their tormented mind, along with all the questions at once. These are just two opposites, but between them lies the full scope of human perception. And of course we will never exhaust the entire phenomenon, never reach its beginning or end. We know only the immediate, visibly current, only superficially, and beginnings and ends remain for now, fantastical to us. By the way, one of my respected correspondents told me last summer about a strange and unresolved suicide which I had intended to discuss. This suicide is a mystery, both outwardly and inwardly. In keeping with human nature, I of course try to solve this mystery, to settle and find peace with it. Suicide of a young girl, no more than 23 or 24, a daughter of a well-known Russian immigrant, she was born abroad, Russian by blood, but almost not Russian at all in upbringing. I think the newspapers briefly mentioned her at this time, but the details are quite curious. She soaked cotton with chloroform, wrapped it around her face and lay down on the bed. That's how she died. Before her death, she left the following note. I am undertaking a long journey. If the suicide doesn't succeed, let everyone gather to celebrate my resurrection with glasses of Krikow. But if it succeeds, I ask only that I be buried only once. Everyone is sure I'm dead, because it is most unpleasant to wake up in a coffin underground. Not chic at all. In this repulsive, crude display of chic, I hear what seems to be a challenge, perhaps indignation or anger, but at what? Coerced natures commit suicide only due to material, visible, external reasons, yet her tone suggests she had no such reason. What then was her indignation about? At the simplicity of life? At its lack of meaning? This recalls the familiar judges and deniers of life, angry at the absurdity of human existence and urge the senselessness of it, tyranny of a blind cause they cannot accept. 
this sounds like a soul rebelling against the straightforwardness of existence, unable to bear this linearity instilled in her in her father's household since childhood. And the most horrific part is that she likely died without any clear doubt, conscious doubt, so-called questions probably never entered her soul. She believed whatever she'd been told since childhood without question. So she simply died from cold darkness and boredom, from a kind of nameless suffering, one that grew unbearably oppressive, like being suffocated by a lack of air. Her soul could not bear the linearity and demanded something more complex without even knowing it. A month ago, a few short lines in a small print appeared in all the Petersburg newspapers about suicide. Poor young girl, seamstress, jumped out of a fourth floor window because she couldn't find work to support herself. It was added that she jumped holding an icon in her hands. This icon in her hands is a strange and unheard of detail in suicide. It's a meek and humble suicide. Here it seemed there was no protest or reproach whatsoever. Simply became impossible to live. God did not will it, and she died after praying. Some things as simple as they may seem stay in your mind for a long time like a haunting guilt, and it almost feels as if you are to blame. This meek soul which took her own life torments my mind involuntarily. It was this death that reminded me of the suicide of the immigrant's daughter I heard about last summer. But what different creatures, as if each came from two different planets, and what different death? But which of these souls suffered more on Earth, if such an idle question is fitting or permissible?